As a BI professional, you aren't just answering your team's questions. You're empowering them with the data to answer their own questions. By pinpointing the answers they require, you can build tools that enable them to access and use the data they need when they need it. Hey there, welcome to this course. If you've already completed the previous one, you might remember me. But if you're just joining us, I'm Ed. I'm a product manager here at Google. I'm really excited to help you get started with data models and extract, transform, and load, or ETL, pipelines. As you've been learning, BI professionals are responsible for analyzing data to generate meaningful insights and solve problems, answer questions, find patterns, and inform business decisions. A large part of this is building tools to provide stakeholders with ongoing insights. This course is going to focus on those tools and how to automate them in order to pull data from different sources, monitor it, and provide data-driven insights. First, you'll learn about design patterns and database schemas, including common structures that BI professionals use. You'll also be introduced to data pipelines and ETL processes. You've learned that ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. This refers to the process of gathering data from source systems, converting it into a useful format, and bringing it into a data warehouse or other unified destination system. This will be an important part of your job as a BI professional. You will also develop strategies for gathering information from stakeholders in order to help you develop more useful tools and processes for your team. After that, you'll focus on database optimization to reduce response time or the time it takes for a database to complete a user request. This will include exploring different types of databases and the five factors of database performance, workload, throughput, resources, optimization, and contention. Finally, you'll learn about the importance of quality testing your ETL processes, validating your database schema, and verifying business rules. Once you finish this course, you'll have the opportunity to put your new skills to work by continuing your portfolio project. You'll apply your skills to a realistic business scenario, which is a great way to demonstrate your BI knowledge to potential employers. As you've been learning, a large part of BI is making other people's jobs easier by automating, simplifying, and enhancing their processes. For example, in one of my projects, I helped the central finance team aggregate years worth of global sales. This allowed my team to identify the underlying drivers that affected trends in prices and quantities sold. They were then able to clearly report these findings to key stakeholders. I love solving problems and making my team's lives a little easier, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited to teach you more about data modeling and pipelines in this course. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the first section of this course. You're going to learn about how BI professionals use data models to help them build database systems, how schemas help professionals understand and organize those systems, and how pipeline processes move data from one part of the system to another. We'll start by exploring data modeling foundations, as well as common schemas and key database elements. We'll also consider how business needs determine the kinds of database systems that a BI professional might implement. We'll then shift to pipelines and ETL processes, which are the tools that move data throughout the system and make sure it's accessible and useful. By the time you're done, you'll have added many more important tools to your BI toolbox. Let's get started. In this video, we're going to explore data modeling, design patterns, and schemas. If you've been working with databases, or if you're coming from the Google Data Analytics Certificate, you may be familiar with data modeling as a way to think about organizing data. Maybe you're even already using schemas to understand how databases are designed. As you've learned, a database is a collection of data stored in a computer system. In order to make databases useful, the data has to be organized. This includes both source systems, from which data is ingested and moved, and the destination database, where it will be acted upon. These source systems could include data lakes, which are database systems that store large amounts of raw data in its original format until it's needed. Another type of source system is an online transaction processing, or OLTP, database. An OLTP database is one that has been optimized for data processing instead of analysis. One type of destination system is a data mart, which is a subject-oriented database that can be a subset of a larger data warehouse. 
Another possibility is using an online analytical processing, or OLAP, database. This is a tool that has been optimized for analysis in addition to processing and can analyze data from multiple databases. You will learn more about these things later. But for now, just understand that a big part of a BI professional's responsibility is to create the destination database model. Then, you'll organize the systems, tools, and storage accordingly, including designing how the data is organized and stored. These systems all play a part in the tools you'll be building later on, so they're important foundations for key BI processes. When it comes to organization, you likely know that there are two types of data, unstructured and structured. Unstructured data is not organized in any easily identifiable manner. Structured data has been organized in a certain format, such as rows and columns. If you'd like to revisit different data types, take a moment to review this information from the Data Analytics Certificate. Now, it can be tricky to understand structure, so this is where data modeling comes in. As you learned previously, a data model is a tool for organizing data elements and how they relate to one another. These are conceptual models that help keep data consistent across a system. This means they give us an idea of how the data is organized in theory. Think back to Furnace's perfect train of business intelligence. A data model is like a map of that train system. It helps you navigate the database by giving you directions through the system. Data modeling is a process of creating these tools. In order to create the data model, BI professionals will often use what is referred to as a design pattern. A design pattern is a solution that uses relevant measures and facts to create a model to support business needs. Think of it like a reusable problem-solving template, which may be applied to many different scenarios. You may be more familiar with the output of the design pattern, a database schema. As a refresher, a schema is a way of describing how something, such as data, is organized. You may have encountered schemas before while working with databases. For example, some common schemas you might be familiar with include relational models, star schemas, snowflake schemas, and NoSQL schemas. These different schemas enable us to describe the model being used to organize the data. If the design pattern is the template for the data model, then the schema is the summary of that model. Because BI professionals play such an important role in creating these systems, understanding data modeling is an essential part of the job. Coming up, you're going to learn more about how design patterns and schemas are used in BI and get a chance to practice data modeling yourself. Bye for now. If you've been working with databases using SQL, you're probably already familiar with relational databases. In this video, you're going to return to the concept of relational databases and learn about a specific kind of relational modeling technique that is used in business intelligence, dimensional modeling. As a refresher, a relational database contains a series of tables that can be connected to form relationships. These relationships are established using primary and foreign keys. Check out this car dealership database. Branch ID is the primary key in the car dealership's table, but it is the foreign key in the product details table. This connects these two tables directly. VIN is the primary key in the product details table and the foreign key in the repair parts table. Notice how these connections actually create relationships between all of these tables. Even the car dealerships and repair parts tables are connected by the product details table. If you took the Google Data Analytics Certificate, you learned that a primary key is an identifier in a database that references a column in which each value is unique. For BI, we're going to expand this idea. A primary key is an identifier in a database that references a column or a group of columns in which each row uniquely identifies each record in the table. In this database, we have primary keys in each table, branch ID, VIN, and part ID. A foreign key is a field within a database table that's a primary key in another table. The primary keys from each table also appear as foreign keys in other tables which builds those connections. Basically, a primary key can be used to impose constraints on the database that ensure data in a specific column is unique by specifically identifying a record in a relational database table. Only one primary key can exist in a table, but a table may have many foreign keys. Okay, now let's move on to dimensional models. 
A dimensional model is a type of relational model that has been optimized to quickly retrieve data from a data warehouse. Dimensional models can be broken down into facts for measurement and dimensions that add attributes for context. In a dimensional model, a fact is a measurement or metric. For example, a monthly sales number could be a fact and a dimension is a piece of information that provides more detail and context regarding that fact. It's the who, what, where, when, why, and how. So, if our monthly sales number is the fact, then the dimensions could be information about each sale, including the customer, the store location, and what products were sold. Next, let's consider attributes. If you earned your Google Data Analytics certificate, you learn about attributes and tables. An attribute is a characteristic or a quality of data used to label the table columns. In dimensional models, attributes work kind of the same way. An attribute is a characteristic or a quality used to describe a dimension. So a dimension provides information about a fact, and an attribute provides information about a dimension. Think about a passport. One dimension on your passport is your hair and eye color. If you have brown hair and eyes, Brown is the attribute that describes that dimension. Let's use another simple example to clarify things. In our car dealership example, if we explore the customer dimension, we might have attributes such as name, address, and phone number listed for each customer. Now that we've established the facts, dimensions, and attributes, it's time for the dimensional model to use these things to create two types of tables, fact tables and dimension tables. A fact table contains measurements or metrics related to a particular event. This is the primary table that contains the facts and their relationship with the dimensions. Basically, each row in the fact table represents one event. The entire table could aggregate several events, such as sales in a day. A dimension table is where attributes of the dimensions of a fact are stored. These tables are joined to the appropriate fact table using the foreign key. This gives meaning and context to the facts. And that's how tables are connected in a dimensional model. Understanding how dimensional modeling builds connections will help you understand database design as a BI professional. This will also clarify database schemas, which are the output of design patterns. Coming up, we're going to check out different kinds of schemas that result from this type of modeling to understand how these concepts work in practice. In a previous video, we explored how BI professionals use dimensional models. They make it possible to organize data using connected facts, dimensions, and attributes to create a design pattern. A schema is the final output of that pattern. As you've learned, a schema is a way of describing how something, such as data, is organized. In a database, it's the logical definition of the data elements, physical characteristics, and interrelationships that exist within the model. Think of the schema like a blueprint. It doesn't hold data itself but describes the shape of the data and how it might relate to other tables or models. Any entry in the database is an instance of that schema and will contain all of the properties described in the schema. There are several common schemas that you may encounter in business intelligence, including STAR, Snowflake, and denormalize or NoSQL schemas. STAR and Snowflake schemas are some of the most common iterations of an actual dimensional model in practice. A star schema is a schema consisting of one fact table that references any number of dimension tables. As its name suggests, this schema is shaped like a star. Notice how each of the dimension tables is connected to the fact table at the center. Star schemas are designed to monitor data instead of analyzing it. In this way, they enable analysts to rapidly process data. Therefore, they are ideal for high-scale information delivery, and they make output more efficient because of the limited number of tables and clear direct relationships. Next, we have snowflake schemas, which tend to be more complicated than star schemas, but the principle is the same. A snowflake schema is an extension of a star schema with additional dimensions and, often, subdimensions. These dimensions and subdimensions break down the schema into even more specific tables, creating a snowflake pattern. Like snowflakes in nature, a snowflake schema and the relationships within it can be complex. Here's an example. Notice how the fact table is still at the center, but now there are subdimension tables connected to the dimension tables, which gives us a more complicated web. Now you have a basic idea of the common schemas you might encounter in BI. 
Understanding schemas can help you recognize the different ways databases are constructed and how BI professionals influence database functionality. Later on, you're going to have more opportunities to explore these different schemas and even construct some yourself. As we continue our discussion of database modeling and schemas, it's important to understand that there are different facets of databases that a business intelligence professional might need to consider for their organization. This is because the database framework, including how platforms are organized and how data is stored and processed, affects how data is used. Let's start with an example. Think about a grocery store's database systems. They manage daily business processes and analyze and draw insights from data. For example, in addition to enabling users to manage sales, a grocer's database must help decision makers understand what items customers are buying and which promotions are the most effective. In this video, we're going to check out a few examples of database frameworks and learn how they're different from one another. In particular, databases vary based on how the data is processed organized, and stored. For this reason, it's important to know what type of database your company is using. You will design different data models depending on how data is stored and accessed on that platform. In addition, another key responsibility for BI professionals is to facilitate database migrations, which are often necessary when technology changes and businesses grow. A database migration involves moving data from one source platform to another target database. During a migration, users transition the current database schemas to a new desired state. This could involve adding tables or columns, splitting fields, removing elements, changing data types, or other improvements. The database migration process often requires numerous phases and iterations, as well as lots of testing. These are huge projects for BI teams, and you don't necessarily just want to take the original schema and use it in the new one. So in this video, We'll discuss several types of databases, including OLTP, OLAP, row-based, columnar, distributed, single-homed, separated storage and compute, and combined databases. The first two database technologies we're going to explore, OLTP and OLAP systems, are based on how data is processed. As you've learned, an online transaction processing, or OLTP database, is one that has been optimized for data processing instead of analysis. OLTP databases manage database modification and are operated with traditional database management system software. These systems are designed to effectively store transactions and help ensure consistency. An example of an OLTP database would be an online bookstore. If two people add the same book to their cart, but there's only one copy, then the person who completes the checkout process first will get the book and the OLTP system ensures that there aren't more copies sold than are in stock. OLTP databases are optimized to read, write, and update single rows of data to ensure that business processes go smoothly, but they aren't necessarily designed to read many rows together. Next, as mentioned previously, OLAP stands for Online Analytical Processing. This is a tool that has been optimized for analysis in addition to processing and can analyze data from multiple databases. OLAP systems pull data from multiple sources at one time to analyze data and provide key business insights. Going back to our online bookstore, an OLAP system could pull data about customer purchases from multiple data warehouses in order to create personalized homepages for customers based on their preferences. OLAP database systems enable organizations to address their analytical needs from a variety of data sources. Depending on the data maturity of the organization, one of your first tasks as a BI professional could be to set up an OLAP system. Many companies have OLTP systems in place to run the business, but they'll rely on you to create a system that can prioritize analyzing data. This is a key first step to drawing insights. Now, moving along to row-based and columnar databases. As the name suggests, row-based databases are organized by rows. Each row in a table is an instance or an entry in the database, and details about that instance are recorded and organized by column. This means that if you wanted the average profit of all sales over the last five years from the bookstore database, you would have to pull each row from those years, even if you don't need all of the information contained in those rows. Columnar databases, on the other hand, are databases organized by columns. 
They are used in data warehouses because they are very useful for analytical queries. Columnar databases process data quickly, only retrieving information from specific columns. In our average profit of all sales example, with a columnar database, you could choose to specifically pull the sales column instead of years worth of rows. The next databases are focused on storage. Single home databases are databases where all of the data is stored in the same physical location. This is less common for organizations dealing with large data sets and will continue to become rarer as more and more organizations move their data storage to online and cloud providers. Now, distributed databases are a collection of data systems distributed across multiple physical locations. Think about them like telephone books. It's not actually possible to keep all the telephone numbers in the world in one book. It would be enormous. So instead, the phone numbers are broken up by location and across multiple books in order to make them more manageable. Finally, we have more ways of storing and processing data. Combined systems are database systems that store and analyze data in the same place. This is a more traditional setup because it enables users to access all of the data that needs to stay in the system long term, but can become unwieldy as more data is added. Like the name implies, separated storage and computing systems are databases where less relevant data is stored remotely and the relevant data is stored locally for analysis. This helps the system run analytical queries more efficiently because you interact with relevant data. It also makes it possible to scale storage and computations independently. For example, if you have a lot of data but only a few people are querying it, you don't need as much computing power, which can save resources. There are a lot of aspects of databases that could affect a BI professional's work. Understanding if a system is OLTP or OLAP, relational or columnar, distributed or single-homed, separated storage and computing, or combined, or even some combination of these is essential. Coming up, we'll go even more in depth about organizing data. You've been investigating data modeling and database schemas, as well as how different types of databases are used in BI. Now, we're going to explore how these concepts can be used to design data warehouses. But before we get into data warehouse design, let's get a refresher on what a data warehouse actually is. As you probably remember from earlier in this course, a database is a collection of data stored in a computer system. Well, a data warehouse is a specific type of database that consolidates data from multiple source systems for data consistency, accuracy, and efficient access. Data warehouses are used to support data-driven decision-making. Often, these systems are managed by data warehousing specialists, but BI professionals may help design them. When it comes to designing a data warehouse, there are a few important things a BI professional will consider. Business needs, the shape and volume of the data, and what model the data warehouse will follow. Business needs are the questions the organization wants to answer or the problems they want to solve. These needs help determine how it will use, store, and organize its data. For example, a hospital storing patient records to monitor health changes has different data requirements than a financial firm analyzing market trends to determine investment strategies. Next, let's explore the shape and volume of data from the source system. Typically, the shape of data refers to the rows and columns of tables within the warehouse and how they are laid out. The volume of data, currently and in the future, also changes how the warehouse is designed. And the model the warehouse will follow includes all of the tools and constraints of the system, such as the database itself and any analysis tools that will be incorporated into the system. Let's return to our bookstore example. To develop its data warehouse, we first need to work with stakeholders to determine their business needs. You'll have an opportunity to learn more about gathering information from stakeholders later. But for now, let's say they tell us that they're interested in measuring store profitability and website traffic in order to evaluate the effectiveness of annual promotions. Now we can look at the shape of the data. Consider the business processes or events that are being captured by tables in the system. Because this is a retail store, the primary business process is sales. We could have a sales table that includes information such as quantity ordered, total base amount, total tax amount, total discounts, and total net amount. These are the facts. As a refresher, a fact is a measurement or metric 
used in the business process. These facts could be related to a series of dimension tables that provide more context. For instance, store, customer, product, promotion, time, stock, or currency could all be dimensions. The information in these tables gives more context to our fact tables, which record the business processes and events. Notice how this data model is starting to shape up. There are several dimension tables all connected to a fact table at the center. And this means we just created a star schema. With this model, you can answer the specific question, the effectiveness of annual promotions, and also generate a dashboard with other KPIs and drill down reports. In this case, we started with the business's specific needs, looked at the data dimensions we had, and organized them into tables that formed relationships. Those relationships helped us determine that a star schema would be the most useful way to organize this data warehouse. Understanding the logic behind data warehouse design will help you develop effective BI processes and systems. Coming up, you're going to work more with database schemas and learn about how data is pulled into the warehouse from other sources. Earlier, we learned about what considerations go into designing data warehouses. Based on the business needs and the shape of the data in our previous example, we created a dimensional model with a star schema. That process is sometimes called logical data modeling. This involves representing different tables in the physical data model. Decisions have to be made about how a system will implement that model. In this video, we're going to learn more about what a schema needs to have for it to be functional. Later, you will use your database schema to validate incoming data to prevent system errors and ensure that the data is useful. For all of these reasons, it's important to consider the schema early on in any BI project. There are four elements a database schema should include. The relevant data, names and data types for each column in each table, consistent formatting across data entries, and unique keys for every database entry and object. As we have already learned, a database schema is a way of describing how data is organized. It doesn't actually contain the data itself, but describes how the data is shaped and the relationships within the database. It needs to include all the data being described, or else it won't be a very useful guide for users trying to understand how the data is laid out. Let's return to our bookstore database example. We know that our data contains a lot of information about the promotions, customers, products, dates, and sales. If our schema doesn't represent that, then we're missing key information. For instance, it's often necessary for a BI professional to add new information to an existing schema if the current schema can't answer a specific business question. So, if the business wants to know which customer service employee responded the most to requests, we would need to add that information to the data warehouse and update the schema accordingly. The schema also needs to include names and data types for each column in each table within the database. Imagine if you didn't organize your kitchen drawers. It would be really difficult to find anything if all of your utensils were just thrown together. Instead, you probably have a specific place where you keep your spoons, forks, and knives. Columns are like your kitchen drawer organizers. They enable you to know what items go where in order to keep things functional. So your schema needs to include the column names and the data type to indicate what data belongs there. In addition to making sure the schema includes all of the relevant data, names, and data types for each column, it's also important to have consistent formatting across all of the data entries in the database. Every data entry is an instance of the schema. For example, imagine we have two transactional systems that we are combining into one database. One tracks the promotions sent to users, and the other tracks sales to customers. In the source systems, the marketing system that tracks promotions could have a user ID column, while the sales system has customer ID instead. To be consistent, in our warehouse schema, we'll want to use just one of these columns. In the schema for this database, we might have a column in one of our tables for product prices. If this data is stored as string type data, Instead of numerical data, it can't be used in calculations, such as adding sales together in a query. Additionally, if any of the data entries have columns that are empty or missing values, this might cause issues. Finally, it's important that there are unique keys for each entry within the database. 
We covered primary and foreign keys in previous videos. These are what build connections between tables and enable us to combine relevant data from across the entire database. So in summary, in order for a database schema to be useful, it should contain the relevant data from the database, the names and data types for each column in each table, consistent formatting across all of the entries within the database, and unique keys connecting the tables. These four elements will ensure that your schema continues to be useful. Developing your schema is an ongoing process. As your data or business needs change, you can continue to adapt the database schema to address these needs. More to come on that soon. So far, we've been learning a lot about how data is organized and stored within data warehouses, and how schemas describe those systems. Part of your job as a BI professional is to build and maintain a data warehouse, taking into consideration all of these systems that exist and are collecting and creating data points. To help smooth this process, we use data pipelines. As a refresher, a data pipeline is a series of processes that transports data from different sources to their final destination for storage and analysis. This automates the flow of data from sources to targets while transforming the data to make it useful as soon as it reaches its destination. In other words, data pipelines are used to get data from point A to point B automatically, save time and resources, and make data more accessible and useful. Basically, data pipelines define what, where, and how data is combined. They automate the processes involved in extracting, transforming, combining, validating, and loading data for further analysis and visualization. Effective data pipelines also help eliminate errors and combat system latency. Having to manually move data over and over whenever someone asks for it, or to update a report repeatedly, would be very time consuming. For example, if a weather station is getting daily information about weather conditions, it would be difficult to manage it manually because of the sheer volume. They need a system that takes in the data and gets it where it needs to go so it can be transformed into insights. One of the most useful things about a data pipeline is that it can pull data from multiple sources, consolidate it, and then migrate it over to its proper destination. These sources could include relational databases, a website application with transactional data, or an external data source. Usually, the pipeline has a push mechanism that enables it to ingest data from multiple sources in near real time or at regular intervals. Once the data has been pulled into the pipeline, it can be loaded to its destination. This could be a data warehouse, data lake, or data mart, which we'll learn more about coming up. Or it could be pulled directly into a BI or analytics application for immediate analysis. Often, while data is being moved from point A to point B, the pipeline is also transforming the data. Transformations include sorting, validation, and verification, making the data easier to analyze. This process is called an ETL system. ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. This is a type of data pipeline that enables data to be gathered from source systems, converted into a useful format, and brought into a data warehouse or other unified destination system. ETL is becoming more and more standard for data pipelines, so we're going to learn more about it later on. Let's say a business analyst has data in one place and needs to move it to another. That's where a data pipeline comes in. But a lot of the time, the structure of the source system isn't ideal for analysis, which is why a BI professional wants to transform that data before it gets to the destination system, and why having set database schemas already designed and ready to receive data is so important. Let's now explore these steps in a little more detail. We can think of a data pipeline functioning in three stages, ingesting the raw data, processing and consolidating it into categories, and dumping the data into reporting tables that users can access. These reporting tables are referred to as target tables. Target tables are the predetermined locations where pipeline data is sent in order to be acted on. Processing and transforming data while it is being moved is important because it ensures the data is ready to be used when it arrives. But let's explore this process in action. Say we're working with an online streaming service to create a data pipeline. First, we'll want to consider the end goal of our pipeline. In this example, 
our stakeholders want to understand their viewer demographics to inform marketing campaigns. This includes information about their viewers' ages and interests, as well as where they are located. Once we've determined what the stakeholder's goal is, we can start thinking about what data we need the pipeline to ingest. In this case, we're going to want demographic data about the customers. Our stakeholders are interested in monthly reports, so we can set up our pipeline to automatically pull in the data we want at monthly intervals. Once the data is ingested, we also want our pipeline to perform some transformations so that it's clean and consistent once it gets delivered to our target tables. Note that these tables would have already been set up within our database to receive the data. And now, we have our customer demographic data and their monthly streaming habits in one table, ready for us to work with. The great thing about data pipelines is that once they're built, they can be scheduled to automatically perform tasks on a regular basis. This means BI team members can focus on drawing business insights from the data, rather than having to repeat this process over and over again. As a BI professional, a big part of your job will involve creating these systems, ensuring that they're running correctly, and updating them whenever business needs change. It's a valuable benefit that your team will really appreciate. We've been learning a lot about data pipelines and how they work. Now, we're going to discuss a specific kind of pipeline, ETL. I mentioned previously that ETL enables data to be gathered from source systems, converted into a useful format, and brought into a data warehouse or other unified destination system. Like other pipelines, ETL processes work in stages, and these stages are extract, transform, and load. Let's start with extraction. In this stage, the pipeline accesses source systems and then reads and collects the necessary data from within them. Many organizations store their data in transactional databases, such as OLTP systems, which are great for logging records. Or maybe the business uses flat files, for instance, HTML or log files. Either way, ETL makes the data useful for analysis by extracting it from its source and moving it into a temporary staging table. Next, we have transformation. The specific transformation activities depend on the structure and format of the destination and the requirement of the business case. But as you've learned, these transformations generally include validating, cleaning, and preparing the data for analysis. This stage is also when the ETL pipeline maps the data types from the sources to the target systems, so that the data fits the destination conventions. Finally, we have the loading stage. This is when data is delivered to its target destination. That could be a data warehouse, a data lake, or an analytics platform that works with direct data feeds. Note that once the data has been delivered, it can exist within multiple locations in multiple formats. For example, there could be a snapshot table that covers a week of data and a larger archive that has some of the same records. This helps ensure that historical data is maintained within the system while giving stakeholders focused, timely data. And if the business is interested in understanding and comparing average monthly sales, the data would be moved to an OLAP system that has been optimized for analysis queries. ETL processes are a common type of data pipeline that BI professionals often build and interact with. Coming up, you're going to learn more about these systems and how they're created. In previous videos, we've been exploring pipeline processes that ingest data from different sources, transform it to match the destination formatting, and push it to a final destination where users can start drawing business insights. BI professionals play a key role in building and maintaining these processes, and they use a variety of tools to help them get the job done. In this video, we'll learn how BI professionals choose the right tool. As a BI professional, your organization will likely have preferred vendors, which means you'll be given a set of available BI solutions. One of the great things about BI is that different tools have very similar principles behind them and similar utility. This is another example of a transferable skill. In other words, your general understanding can be applied to other solutions, no matter which ones your organization prefers. For instance, the first database management system I learned was Microsoft Access. This experience helped me gain a basic understanding of how to build connections between tables, and that made learning new tools more straightforward later in my career. When I started working with MySQL, I was already able to recognize the underlying principles. Now, it's possible that you'll choose the tools you'll be using. 
If that's the case, you'll want to consider the KPIs, how your stakeholders want to view the data, and how the data needs to be moved. As you've learned, a KPI is a quantifiable value closely linked to the business strategy, which is used to track progress toward a goal. KPIs let us know whether or not we're succeeding so that we can adjust our processes to better reach objectives. For example, some financial KPIs are gross profit margin, net profit margin, and return on assets. Or some HR KPIs are rate of promotion and employee satisfaction. Understanding your organization's KPIs means you can select tools based on those needs. Next, depending on how your stakeholders want to view the data, there are different tools you can choose. Stakeholders might ask for graphs, static reports, or dashboards. There are a variety of tools, including Google Data Studio, Looker, Microsoft Power BI, and Tableau. Some others are Azure Analysis Service, Cloud SQL, Pentaho, SSAS, and SSRS SQL Server, which all have reporting tools built in. That's a lot of options. You'll get more insights about these different tools later on. After you've thought about how your stakeholders want to view the data, you'll want to consider your backend tools. This is when you think about how the data needs to be moved. For example, not all BI tools can read data lakes, so, if your organization uses data lakes to store data, then you need to make sure you choose a tool that can do that. Some other important considerations when choosing your backend tools include how to transfer the data, how it should be updated, and how the pipeline combines with other tools in the data transformation process. Each of these points helps you determine must-haves for your tool set, which leads to the best options. Also, it's important to know that you might end up using a combination of tools to create the ideal system. As you've been learning, BI tools have common features, so the skills you learn in these courses can be used no matter which tools you end up working with. Going back to my example, I was able to understand the logic behind transforming and combining tables, whether I was using Microsoft Access or MySQL. This foundation has transferred across the different BI tools I've encountered throughout my career. Coming up, you'll learn more about the solutions that you might work with in the future. You'll also start getting hands-on with some data soon. Recently, you were introduced to data pipelines. You learned that many of the procedures and understandings involved in one pipeline tool can be transferred to other solutions. So in this course, we're going to be using Google Dataflow. But even if you end up working with a different pipeline tool, the skills and steps involved here will be very useful and using Google Dataflow now will be a great opportunity to practice everything you've learned so far. We'll start by introducing you to Dataflow and going over its basic utilities. Later on, you'll use this tool to complete some basic BI tasks and set up your own pipeline. Google Dataflow is a serverless data processing service that reads data from the source, transforms it, and writes it in the destination location. Dataflow creates pipelines with open source libraries, which you can interact with using different languages, including Python and SQL. Dataflow includes a selection of pre-built templates that you can customize, or you can use SQL statements to build your own pipelines. The tool also includes security features to help keep your data safe. Okay, let's open Dataflow and explore it together now. First, we'll log in and go to the console. Once the console is open, let's find the jobs page. If this is your first time using Dataflow, it will say no jobs to display. The jobs page is where we'll find current jobs in our project space. There are options to create job from template or create job from SQL. Snapshots save the current state of a streaming pipeline so that you can start a new version without losing the current one. This is great for testing your pipelines, updating them seamlessly for users, and backing up and recovering old versions. The pipeline section contains a list of the pipelines you have created. Again, if this is your first time using Dataflow, it will display the processes you need to enable before you can start building pipelines. Now is a great time to do that. Just click Fix All to enable the API features and set your location. The Notebook section enables you to create and save shareable Jupyter Notebooks with live code. This is useful for first-time ETL tool users to check out examples and visualize the transformations. Finally, we have the SQL workspace. If you have worked with BigQuery before, such as in the Google Data Analytics Certificate, this will be familiar. 
This is where you write and execute SQL queries while working within Dataflow. And there you go. Now you can log into Google Dataflow and start exploring it on your own. We'll have many more opportunities to work with this tool soon. If you're coming to these courses from the Google Data Analytics Certificate, or if you've been working with relational databases, you're probably familiar with the query language SQL. Query languages are specific computer programming languages used to communicate with a database. As a BI professional, you may be expected to use other kinds of programming languages too. That's why in this video, we'll explore one of the most popular programming languages out there, Python. A programming language is a system of words and symbols used to write instructions that computers follow. There are lots of different programming languages, but Python was specifically developed to enable users to write commands in fewer lines than most other languages. Python is also open source, which means it's freely available and may be modified and shared by the people who use it. There's a large community of Python users who develop tools and libraries to make Python better, which means there are a lot of resources available for BI professionals to tap into. Python is a general purpose programming language that can be applied to a variety of contexts. In business intelligence, it's used to connect to a database system to read and modify files. It can also be combined with other software tools to develop pipelines. And it can even process big data and perform calculations. There are a few key things you should understand about Python as you begin your programming journey. First, it is primarily object-oriented and interpreted. Let's first understand what it means to be object-oriented. Object-oriented programming languages are modeled around data objects. These objects are chunks of code that capture certain information. Basically, everything in the system is an object. And once data has been captured within the code, it's labeled and defined by the system so that it can be used again later without having to re-enter the data. Because Python has been adopted pretty broadly by the data community, a lot of libraries have been developed to predefine data structures and common operations that you can apply to the objects in your system. This is extremely useful when you need to repeat analysis or even use the same transformations for multiple projects. Not having to re-enter the code from scratch saves time. Note that object-oriented programming languages differ from functional programming languages, which are modeled around functions. While Python is primarily object-oriented, it can also be used as a functional programming language to create and apply functions. Part of the reason Python is so popular is that it's flexible. But for BI, the really valuable thing about Python is its ability to create and save data objects that can then be interacted with via code. Okay. Now let's consider the fact that Python is an interpreted language. Interpreted languages are programming languages that use an interpreter, typically another program, to read and execute coded instructions. This is different from a compiled programming language, which compiles coded instructions that are executed directly by the target machine. One of the biggest differences between these two types of programming languages is that the compiled code executed by the machine is almost impossible for humans to read. So, Python's interpreted language is very useful for BI professionals because it enables them to use the language in an interactive way. For example, Python can be used to make notebooks. A notebook is an interactive, editable programming environment for creating data reports. This can be a great way to build dynamic reports for stakeholders. Python is a great tool to have in your BI toolbox. There's even an option to use Python commands in Google Dataflow. Pretty soon, you'll get to check it out for yourself when you start writing Python in your Dataflow workspace. You've already learned quite a bit about the different stakeholders that a BI professional might work with in an organization and how to communicate with them. You've also learned that gathering information from stakeholders at the beginning of a project is an essential step of the process. Now that you understand more about pipelines, Let's consider what information you need to gather from stakeholders before building BI processes for them. That way, you'll know exactly what they need and can help make their work as efficient as possible. Part of your job as a BI professional is understanding the current processes in place and how you can integrate BI tools into those existing work streams. Oftentimes in BI, you aren't just trying to answer individual questions every day. You're trying to find out what kinds of questions your team is asking so that you can build them a tool that enables them to get that information themselves. 
it's rare for people to know exactly what they need and communicate that to you. Instead, they will usually come to you with a list of problems or symptoms, and it's your responsibility to figure out how to help them. Stakeholders who are less familiar with data simply don't know what BI processes are possible. This is why cross-business alignment is so important. You want to create a user-centered design where all of the requirements for the entire team are met. That way, your solutions address everyone's needs at once, streamlining their processes as a group. It can be challenging to figure out what all of your different stakeholders require. One option is to create a presentation and lead a workshop session with the different teams. This can be a great way to support cross-business alignment and determine everyone's needs. It's also very helpful to spend some time observing your stakeholders at work and asking them questions about what they're doing and why. In addition, it's important to establish the metrics and what data the target table should contain early on with cross-team stakeholders. This should be done before you start building the tools. As you've learned, a metric is a single quantifiable data point that is used to evaluate performance. In BI, the metrics businesses are usually interested in are KPIs that help them assess how successful they are at achieving certain goals. Understanding those goals and how they can be measured is an important first step in building a BI tool. You also know that target tables are the final destination where data is acted on. So, understanding the end goals helps you design the best process. It's important to remember that building BI processes is a collaborative and iterative process. You will continue gathering information from your stakeholders and using what you've learned until you create a system that works for your team. And even then, you might change it as new needs arise. Often, your stakeholders will have identified their questions, but they may not have identified their assumptions or biases about the project yet. This is where a BI professional can offer insights. Collaborating closely with stakeholders ensures that you are keeping their needs in mind as you design the BI tools that will streamline their processes. Understanding their goals, metrics, and final target tables, and communicating across multiple teams will ensure that you make systems that work for everyone. Hey, great work so far. You're almost done with the first section of this course. You've learned a lot. So far, we've discussed a BI professional's role in the organization and storage of data. You also investigated data models and schemas, how BI professionals develop design patterns based on their organization's needs, and how databases are designed. You've been introduced to data pipelines, ETL processes, and building BI tools that help automate moving data from storage systems to target destinations. You've even started using tools to begin building your own pipelines. Finally, you learn strategies for gathering information from stakeholders to ensure that the tools you create for them actually solve the business problems. But creating systems that manage and move data is just one part of a BI professional's job. You also have to make sure that those systems continue working for your stakeholders. Coming up, you're going to discover how to maintain your BI tools and optimize database systems. I hope you're excited to learn more because there's a lot more I want to share with you. But first, you have another challenge ahead. Feel free to spend some time with the glossary and review any of this section's content before moving on to your next assessment. Then, I'll be here when you're ready to take the next step. In order to efficiently deliver the most up-to-date information to your stakeholders, you must first understand and optimize query performance within your pipelines. And that's what we're going to explore in the next few videos. We'll discover how to increase throughput and minimize the competition for resources within the system to enable the largest possible workload to be processed. We'll get into database systems, including data marts, data lakes, data warehouses, and ELT processes. That's not a typo. ELT is different from ETL. It stands for Extract, Load, and Transform. You'll also witness how these systems contribute to the overall efficiency of your data systems. In addition, you'll investigate the five factors of database performance, workload, throughput, resources, optimization, and contention. And you'll gain some tips for making sure your database intake and storage are the best they can be. Finally, we'll begin thinking about how to design efficient queries that really get the most out of your systems. Let's do it. One of the amazing things about BI is that the tools and processes are constantly evolving which means BI professionals always have new opportunities to build and improve current systems. So, 
let's learn about some other interesting data storage and processing patterns you might encounter as a BI professional. Throughout these courses, we've learned about database systems that make use of data warehouses for their storage needs. As a refresher, a data warehouse is a specific type of database that consolidates data from multiple source systems for data consistency, accuracy, and efficient access. Basically, a data warehouse is a huge collection of data from all of a company's systems. Data warehouses were really common when companies used a single machine to store and compute their relational databases. However, with the rise of cloud technologies and explosion of data volume, new patterns for data storage and computation emerged. One of these tools is a data mart. As you may recall, a data mart is a subject-oriented database that can be a subset of a larger data warehouse. In BI, subject-oriented describes something that is associated with specific areas or departments of a business, such as finance, sales, or marketing. As you're learning, BI projects commonly focus on answering various questions for different teams. So a data mart is a convenient way to access the relevant data that needs to be pulled for a particular project. Now, let's check out data lakes. A data lake is a database system that stores large amounts of raw data in its original format until it's needed. This makes the data easily accessible because it doesn't require a lot of processing. Like a data warehouse, a data lake combines many different sources. But data warehouses are hierarchical, with files and folders to organize the data, whereas data lakes are flat. And while data has been tagged, so it is identifiable, it's not organized. It's fluid, which is why it's called a data lake. Data lakes don't require the data to be transformed before storage, so they are useful if your BI system is ingesting a lot of different data types. But, of course, this data eventually needs to get organized and transformed. One way to integrate data lakes into a data system is through ELT. Previously, we learned about the ETL process, where data is extracted from the source into the pipeline, transformed while it is being transported, and then loaded into its destination. ELT takes the same steps, but reorganizes them so that the pipeline extracts, loads, and then transforms the data. Basically, ELT is a type of data pipeline that enables data to be gathered from different sources, usually data lakes, then loaded into a unified destination system and transformed into a useful format. ELT enables BI professionals to ingest so many different kinds of data into a storage system as soon as that data is available, and they only have to transform the data they need. ELT also reduces storage costs and enables businesses to scale storage and computation resources independently. As technology advances, the processes and tools available also advance. And that's great. Some of the most successful BI professionals do well because they are curious, lifelong learners. We've been investigating database optimization and why it's important to make sure that users are able to get what they need from the system as efficiently as possible. Successful optimization can be measured by the database performance. Database performance is a measure of the workload that can be processed by a database as well as associated costs. In this video, we're going to consider the factors that influence database performance, workload, throughput, resources, optimization, and contention. First, we'll start with workload. In BI, workload refers to the combination of transactions, queries, analysis, and system commands being processed by the database system at any given time. It's common for a database's workload to fluctuate drastically from day to day, depending on what jobs are being processed and how many users are interacting with the database. The good news is that you can often predict these fluctuations. For instance, there might be a higher workload at the end of the month when reports are being processed, or the workload might be really light right before a holiday. Next, we have throughput. Throughput is the overall capability of the database's hardware and software to process requests. Throughput is made up of the input and output speed, the central processor unit speed, how well the machine can run parallel processes, the database management system, and the operating system and system software. Basically, throughput describes the workload size that the system can handle. Okay, let's get into resources. In BI, Resources are the hardware and software tools available for use in a database system. This includes the disk space and memory. Resources are a big part of a database system's ability to process requests and handle data. 
and they can also fluctuate, especially if the hardware or other dedicated resources are shared with additional databases, software applications, or services. Also, cloud-based systems are particularly prone to fluctuation, so it's useful to remember that external factors can affect performance. Now we come to optimization. Optimization involves maximizing the speed and efficiency with which data is retrieved in order to ensure high levels of database performance. This is one of the most important factors that BI professionals return to again and again. So coming up soon, we're going to talk about it in more detail. Finally, the last factor of database performance is contention. Contention occurs when two or more components attempt to use a single resource in a conflicting way. This can really slow things down. For instance, if there are multiple processes trying to update the same piece of data, those processes are in contention. As contention increases, the throughput of the database decreases. So limiting contention as much as possible will help ensure the database is performing at its best. And there you have five factors of database performance. Workload, throughput, resources, optimization, and contention. Coming up, we're going to check out an example of these factors in action so you can understand more about how each contributes to database performance. Recently, we've been learning a lot about database performance. As a refresher, this is a measure of the workload that can be processed by the database, as well as associated costs. We also explored optimization, which is one of the most important factors of database performance. You'll recall that optimization involves maximizing the speed and efficiency with which data is retrieved in order to ensure high levels of database performance. In this video, we're going to focus on optimization and how BI professionals optimize databases by examining resource use and identifying better data sources and structures. Again, the goal is to enable the system to process the largest possible workload at the most reasonable cost. So this requires speedy response time, which is how long it takes for a database to respond to a user request. Here's an example. Imagine you're a BI professional receiving emails from people on your team who say that it's taking longer than usual for them to pull the data they need from the database. At first, this seems like a pretty minor inconvenience, but a slow database can be disruptive and cost your team a lot of time. If they have to stop and wait whenever they need to pull data or perform a calculation, it really affects their work. There are a few reasons that users might be encountering this issue. Maybe the queries aren't fully optimized or the database isn't properly indexed or partitioned. Perhaps the data is fragmented or there isn't enough memory or CPU. Let's examine each of these. First, if the queries users are writing to interact with the database are inefficient, it can actually slow down your database resources. To avoid this, the first step is to simply revisit the queries to ensure they're as efficient as possible. The next step is to consider the query plan. In a relational database system that uses SQL, a query plan is a description of the steps the database system takes in order to execute a query. As you've learned, a query tells the system what to do, but not necessarily how to do it. So the query plan is the how. If queries are running slowly, checking the query plan to find out if there are steps causing more draw than necessary can be helpful. This is another iterative process. After checking the query plan, you might rewrite the query or create new tables and then check the query plan again. Okay, now let's consider indexing. An index is an organizational tag used to quickly locate data within a database system. If the tables within a database haven't been fully indexed, it can take the database longer to locate resources. In cloud-based systems working with big data, you might have data partitions instead of indexes. Data partitioning is the process of dividing a database into distinct, logical parts in order to improve query processing and increase manageability. The distribution of data within the system is extremely important, so ensuring that data has been partitioned appropriately and consistently is part of optimization too. The next issue is fragmented data. Fragmented data occurs when data is broken up into many pieces that are not stored together, often as a result of using the data frequently or creating, deleting, or modifying files. For example, if you are accessing the same data often and versions of it are being saved in your cache, those versions are actually causing fragmentation in your system. Finally, if your database is having trouble keeping up with your organization's demands, 
it might mean there isn't enough memory available to process everyone's requests. Making sure your database has the capacity to handle everything you ask of it is critical. Consider our example again. You received some emails from the team stating that it was taking longer than usual to access data from the database. After learning about the slowdown from your team, you were able to assess the situation and make some fixes. Addressing the issues allowed you to ensure the database was working as efficiently as possible for your team. Problem solved. But database optimization is an ongoing process, and you'll need to continue to monitor performance to keep everything running smoothly. Earlier, we learned about the five factors of database performance. Workload, throughput, resources, optimization, and contention. But how do they actually operate within a working system? Let's explore a database and witness how the five factors affect its performance. Before we get into how the five factors influence this database, let's understand how it's been designed. In this example, we'll be checking out a movie theater chain system. There are a few things that we'll need to consider during optimization. First, let's think about what this database is being used for. In this case, the movie theater chain uses data related to ticket purchases, revenue, and audience preferences in order to make decisions about what movies to play and potential promotions. Second, we'll consider where the data is coming from. In this example, it's being pushed from multiple sources into an OLAP system where analysis takes place. Also, the database uses data from individual theaters' OLTP systems in order to explore trends in ticket sales for different movie times and genres. The OLTP systems that manage transaction data use a Snowflake database model. At the center, there is a fact table capturing the most important information about the tickets, such as whether or not a specific seat has been reserved, the reservation type, the screening ID, the employee ID of whoever entered the reservation, and the seat number. In order to capture details about these facts, the model also includes several dimension tables connected to the fact table, with information on employee, movie, screening, auditorium, seat, and reservation. This database is fairly straightforward, and it enables each movie theater to record data in these different tables and prevents them from accidentally booking the same seat twice. However, these individual OLTP systems aren't designed for analysis, which is why the data needs to be pulled into the destination OLAP system. There, it can be accessed and explored by users in order to gain insights and make business decisions. Okay, now that we know a little more about our database, let's find out how the five factors of database performance influence it. First, as you know, workload is a combination of transactions, queries, data warehousing analysis, and system commands being processed by the database system at any given time. In this case, most of the workload is processing user requests such as generating scheduled reports or fulfilling queries. If the database can't handle the workload, it might cause the system to crash, disrupting users' ability to access and use the data. Maybe a report requires a lot of resources to generate, or there might be a growing number of analysts accessing this data, but we know that it's often possible to predict peak workload times, so we can make adjustments to ensure the system can handle these requests. Now, let's explore throughput. Again. This is the overall capability of the database's hardware and software to process requests. Because our movie theater system is mostly focused on analysis of data from OLTP databases, we're working with an OLAP database that primarily uses cloud storage. The database storage processes and the computers within the system that are accessing the cloud data need to be capable of handling the theater's workload, especially when the database system is being used a lot. The hardware and software that compose the system's throughput are the resources. For example, the movie theaters might use a cache controller disk to help the database manage the storage and retrieval of data from the memory systems. Next, we have optimization, which you've already learned a lot about. Ideally, users should be able to access transaction data that has been ingested from multiple other database systems. If retrieval slows down, it can take longer to get the data and provide insights to stakeholders. This is why keeping the database optimized, even after it has been set up, is important. The last factor of database performance is contention. The movie theater company has a team with many different analysts accessing and using this data. 
That's in addition to the automated transformations being applied to the data and the reports being generated. All these requests can end up competing with each other and cause contention. And this can potentially be problematic if the system processes multiple requests at the same time, essentially making the same updates over and over. To limit this, the database processes queries in the order the requests are made. And now, you've gotten a chance to explore how the five factors of database performance might affect a real database system. No matter how simple or complex, these are essential considerations for any BI professional. You've been learning about database design and the role BI professionals play in creating and maintaining useful database systems. So far, you focus on the five factors of database performance, workload, throughput, resources, optimization, and contention. You also learn some strategies specifically for database optimization and what issues to check for if your team members start noticing a slowdown. You even explored how the five factors can affect actual databases, database optimization, and the importance of keeping databases up to speed. As a BI professional, developing processes that enable your team to pull insights themselves is a key part of the job. But systems and processes change over time. They stop working or need to be updated. That's one of the reasons why continuing to monitor database performance is so important. The database system should have lasting high performance levels. Coming up, you're going to discover more about optimizing systems and the tools you'll create as a BI professional. But first, you have another weekly challenge. As always, feel free to check back over any of the material and review the glossary to prepare yourself for success. Once you've completed your assessment, I'll meet you back here for more about optimizing ETL processes. Great job. You've learned a lot about how BI professionals ensure that their organization's database systems and tools continue to be as useful as possible. This includes evaluating whether fixes or updates are needed and performing optimization when necessary. Previously, we focused specifically on optimizing database systems. Now, it's time to explore optimizing pipelines and ETL processes. In this section of the course, you'll learn about ETL quality testing, data schema validation, verifying business rules, and general performance testing. Through ETL quality testing, BI professionals aim to confirm that data is extracted, transformed, and loaded to its destination without any errors or issues. This is especially important because sometimes your pipeline might start producing bad or misleading results. This can happen when the original sources are changed without your knowledge. Also, we'll soon cover data schema validation, which is used to keep source data aligned with the target database schema. A schema mismatch can cause system failures, so this is critical to keeping the ETL running smoothly. We'll also investigate data integrity and how built-in quality checks defend against potential problems. Finally, We'll focus on verifying business rules and general performance testing to make sure the pipeline is fulfilling the business need it was intended to. There's a lot to come, so let's begin exploring the optimization processes for pipelines and ETL. You're already familiar with ETL pipelines, where data is extracted from a source, transformed while it's being moved, and then loaded into a destination table where it can be actioned on. Part of the transformation step in the ETL process is quality testing. In BI, quality testing is the process of checking data for defects in order to prevent system failures. The goal is to ensure the pipeline continues to work properly. Quality testing can be time-consuming, but it's extremely important for an organization's workflow. Quality testing involves seven validation elements. Completeness, consistency, conformity, accuracy, redundancy, integrity, and timeliness. That's a lot of elements to keep in mind, but we're going to break down each in this video, starting with completeness. Also, you may recall some of these concepts from the Google Data Analytics Certificate. If you'd like, take a few minutes to review that content before moving ahead. All right, let's start with checking for completeness. This involves confirming that the data contains all desired components or measures. For example, imagine you're working with sales data and you have an ETL pipeline that delivers monthly data to target tables. These target tables are used to generate reports for stakeholders. If the data being moved through the pipeline is missing a week of data, or information about one of the best-selling products, or another key metric, then the calculations used to create reports won't have complete, accurate data. 
Next, we have consistency. You might have learned that in a data analytics context, consistency deals with the degree to which data is repeatable from different points of entry or collection. In BI, it's a bit different. Here, consistency involves confirming that data is compatible and in agreement across all systems. Imagine two systems. One is an HR database with employee data, and the other is a payroll system. If the HR database lists an employee who either isn't in the payroll system or is listed differently there, that inconsistency could create problems. Next is conformity. This element is all about whether the data fits the required destination format. Consider sales data in an ETL pipeline. If the data being extracted includes dates of sale that don't match the dates that the destination table is designed to hold, that's going to create errors. Now, accuracy has to do with the data conforming to the actual entity that's being measured or described. Another way of thinking about this is if the data represents real values. So with that in mind, any mistyped entries or errors from the source are problematic because they will be reflected in the destination. Source systems requiring a lot of manual data entry are more likely to have issues with accuracy. Like if a purchase of a hamburger was misentered as selling for a million dollars, that's something you need to take care of before the data is loaded. If you're using a relational storage database, ensuring that there isn't any redundancy in the data is another important element of quality testing. In a BI context, redundancy is moving, transforming, or storing more than the necessary data. This occurs when the same piece of data is stored in two or more places. Moving data through a pipeline requires processing power, time, and resources. So it's important not to move any more data than you need. For instance, if client company names are listed in multiple places, but are only required to appear in one place in the destination table, we wouldn't want to waste resources on loading that redundant data. Now we come to integrity. Integrity concerns the accuracy, completeness, consistency, and trustworthiness of data throughout its life cycle. In quality testing, this often means checking for any missing relationships in the data values. As an example, say a company's sales database is relational. BI professionals would depend on those relationships to manipulate data within the database and to query the data. Maybe they have product IDs and descriptions in a database, but if there's a description and no corresponding record with the ID, there's now an issue with data integrity. It's essential to make sure this is addressed before moving on to analysis. Data mapping is one way to make sure that the data from the source matches the data in the target database. You'll learn more about this later, but basically, data mapping is the process of matching fields from one data source to another. Last but not least, you want to make sure your data is timely. Timeliness involves confirming that data is current. This check is done specifically to make sure data has been updated with the most recent information that can provide relevant insights. For example, if a data warehouse is supposed to contain daily data, but doesn't update properly, then the pipeline can't ingest the latest information. BI professionals are mostly interested in exploring current data in order to allow stakeholders to gain the freshest insights. This definitely won't be possible if the data being moved is already outdated. A lot goes into ETL quality testing, and it can be a tricky process. But remembering these seven key elements is a wonderful first step toward creating high-quality pipelines. Coming up, you're going to learn even more about these checks and other performance tests for ETL processes. Bye for now. You're learning a lot about the importance of quality testing in ETL. And you now know that a key part of the process is checking for conformity, or whether the data fits the required destination format. To ensure conformity from source to destination, BI professionals have three very effective tools, schema validation, data dictionaries, and data lineages. In this video, we'll examine how they can help you establish consistent data governance. First, schema validation is a process to ensure that the source system data schema matches the target database data schema. As you're learning, if the schemas don't align, this can cause system failures that are very difficult to fix. So building schema validation into your workflow is important to prevent these issues. Database tools offer various schema validation options that can be used to check incoming data against the destination schema requirements. For example, you could dictate that a certain column contains only numerical data. Then, if you try to enter something in that column that doesn't conform, 
the system will flag the error. Or, in a relational database, you could specify that an ID number must be a unique field. That means the same ID can't be added if it matches an existing entry. This prevents redundancies in the data. With these properties in action, if the data doesn't conform and throws an error, you'll be alerted. Or if it meets the requirements, you'll know it's valid and safe to load. Schema validation properties should ensure three things. The keys are still valid after transformation, the table relationships have been preserved, and the conventions are consistent across the database. Let's start with the keys. As you've been learning, relational databases use primary and foreign keys to build relationships among tables. These keys should continue to function after you've moved data from one system into another. For example, if your source system uses customer ID as a key, then that needs to be valid in the target schema as well. This is related to the next property of schema validation, making sure the table relationships have been preserved. When taking in data from a source system, it's important that these keys remain valid in the target system so the relationships can still be used to connect tables or that they are transformed to match the target schema. For example, if the customer ID key doesn't apply to our target system, then all of the tables that used it as a primary or foreign key are disconnected. If the relationships between tables have been broken while data is being moved, then the data becomes hard to access and use. And that's the whole reason we moved it to our target system. Finally, you want to ensure that the conventions are consistent with the target database's schema. Sometimes, data from outside sources uses different conventions for naming columns and tables. For example, you could have a source system that uses employee ID as one word to identify that field, but the target database might use employee underscore ID. You'll need to ensure these are consistent so you don't get errors when trying to pull data for analysis. In addition to the properties themselves, there are some other documentation tools that support data schema validation, data dictionaries and data lineages. A data dictionary is a collection of information that describes the content, format, and structure of data objects within a database, as well as their relationships. You might also hear this referred to as a metadata repository. You may know that metadata is data about data. This is a very important concept in BI, so if you'd like to review some of the lessons about metadata from the Google Data Analytics Certificate, go ahead and do that now. In the case of data dictionaries, these represent metadata because they're basically using one type of data, metadata, to define the use and origin of another piece of data. There are several reasons you might want to create a data dictionary for your team. For one thing, it helps avoid inconsistencies throughout a project. In addition, it enables you to define any conventions that other team members need to know in order to create more alignment across teams. Best of all, it makes the data easier to work with. Now, let's explore data lineages. Data lineage describes a process of identifying the origin of data, where it has moved throughout the system, and how it has transformed over time. This is useful because if you do get an error, you can track the lineage of that piece of data and understand what happened along the way to cause the problem. Then, you can put standards in place to avoid the same issue in the future. Using schema validation, data dictionaries, and data lineages really helps BI professionals promote consistency as data is moved from the source to the destination. And this means all users can be confident in the BI solutions being created. We'll keep exploring these concepts soon. One of the best ways to learn is through a case study. When you witness how something happened at an actual organization, it really brings ideas and concepts to life. So in this video, we're going to check out schema governance in action at an educational nonprofit. In this scenario, decision makers at the nonprofit are interested in measuring educational outcomes in their community. In order to do this, they are ingesting data from school databases in order to evaluate learning goals, national education statistics, and student surveys. Because they're pulling data from multiple sources into their own database system, it's important that they maintain consistency across all of the data to prevent errors and avoid losing important information. Luckily, this organization already has a data dictionary and lineage in place to establish the necessary standards. Let's check out an example of a column from the student information table. This table has five columns, student ID, school system, school, age, and grade point average. Each column in this table has been recorded in the data dictionary to specify what information it contains. 
so we can go to the data dictionary entry for the school system column to double check the standards for this table. As a refresher, a data dictionary is a collection of information that describes the content, format, and structure of data objects within a database and their relationships. This dictionary records four specific properties, the name of the column, its definition, the data type, and possible values. The dictionary entry for age lets us know the data objects in this column contain information about a student's age. It also tells us that this is integer type data. We can use these properties to compare incoming data to the destination table. If any data objects aren't integer type data, then the schema validation will flag the error before the incorrect data is ingested into the destination. So what happens when a data object fails this schema validation process? We can actually use the data lineage to trace the journey of this piece of data and find out where in the process we might want to add a quality check. Again, a data lineage includes information about the data's origin, where it is moved throughout the system, and how it has transformed over time. During the schema validation process, this piece of data threw an error because it isn't currently cast as integer type. When we check the data lineage, we can track this object's movement through our system. This data started in an individual school's database before being read into the school system's database. The individual school's data was ingested by our pipeline along with data from other school systems, and then organized and transformed during the movement process. Apparently, when this data was input in the school's original database, it wasn't typecasted correctly. We can confirm that by checking its data type throughout the lineage. The lineage also includes all the transformations that this data has undergone so far. Also, we might at this point notice that typecasting isn't built into our transformation process during quality checks. That's great news. Now we know that that's a process we should incorporate into the pipeline before data is read into the destination table. In this case, age data objects should be integer type. And that's how schema governance and validation can help improve systems and prevent errors. There are other kinds of tests that should be applied to a pipeline to make sure it's functioning correctly, which we'll learn more about soon. But now, you have a better understanding of how to validate the schema and keep improving your pipeline processes. So far, we've learned a lot about database performance, quality testing, and schema validation, and how these checks ensure the database and pipeline system continue to work as expected. Now, we're going to explore another important check, making sure that the systems and processes you have created actually meet business needs. This is essential for ensuring that those systems continue to be relevant to your stakeholders. To do this, BI professionals verify business rules. In BI, a business rule is a statement that creates a restriction on specific parts of a database. For example, a shipping database might impose a business rule that states shipping dates can't come before order dates. This prevents order dates and shipping dates from being mixed up and causing errors within the system. Business rules are created according to the way a particular organization uses its data. In a previous video, we discovered how important it can be to observe how a business uses data before building a database system or ETL process. Understanding the actual needs guides the design, and this is true for business rules too. The business rules you create will affect a lot of a database's design. What data is collected and stored, how relationships are defined, what kind of information the database provides, and the security of the data. This helps ensure the database is performing as intended. Business rules are different at every organization because the way organizations interact with their data is always different. Plus, business rules are also always changing, which is why keeping a record of what rules exist and why is critical. Here's another example. Consider a library database. The primary need of the users, who are librarians in this case, is to check out books and maintain information about patrons. Because of this, there are a few business rules this library might impose on the database to regulate the system. One rule could be that library patrons cannot check out more than five books at a time. The database won't let a user check out a sixth book. Or the database could have a rule that the same book cannot be checked out by two people at the same time. If someone tries, the librarians would be alerted that there's a redundancy. Another business rule could be that specific information must be entered into the system for a new book to be added to the library inventory. Basically, 
Verification involves ensuring that data imported into the target database complies with business rules. On top of that, these rules are important pieces of knowledge that help a BI professional understand how a business and its processes function. This helps the BI professional become a subject matter expert and trusted advisor. As you're probably noticing, this process is very similar to schema validation. In schema validation, you take the target database's schema and compare incoming data to it. Data that fails this check is not ingested into the destination database. Similarly, you will compare incoming data to the business rules before loading it into the database. In our library example, if a patron puts in a request for a book, but they already have more than five books from the library, then this incoming data doesn't comply with the preset business rule, and it prevents them from checking out the book. And that's the basics about verifying business rules. These checks are important because they ensure that databases do their jobs as intended. And because business rules are so integral to the way databases function, verifying that they're working correctly is very important. Coming up, you'll get a chance to explore business rules in more detail. As a BI professional, your job doesn't end once you've built the database systems and pipeline tools for your organization. It's also important that you ensure they continue to work as intended and handle potential errors before they become problems. In order to address those ongoing needs, you've been learning a lot. First, you explored the importance of quality testing in an ETL system. This involved checking incoming data for completeness, consistency, conformity, accuracy, redundancy, integrity, and timeliness. You also investigated schema governance and how schema validation can prevent incoming data from causing errors in the system by making sure it conforms to the schema properties of the destination database. After that, you discovered why verifying business rules is an important step in optimization, because it ensures that the data coming in meets the business needs of the organization using it. Maintaining the storage systems that users interact with is an important part of ensuring that your system is meeting the business's needs. This is why database optimization is so important. But it's just as important to ensure that the systems that move data from place to place are as efficient as possible. And that's where optimizing pipelines and ETL systems comes in. Coming up, you have another assessment. I know you can do this. And just as a reminder, you can review any of the material as you get ready, as well as the latest glossary. So feel free to revisit any videos or readings to get a refresher before the assessment. After that, you have an exciting new phase of your portfolio project to tackle. You'll have the chance to put everything you've been learning into practice by developing BI tools and processes yourself. You're making excellent progress toward a career in BI. Congratulations on completing another course. You're that much closer to finishing this program and receiving your certificate. You've learned a lot already. So take a moment to consider everything we've covered in this course and celebrate. For example, you learned about database modeling, design patterns, and how to use database schemas to describe those design patterns. You also discovered many kinds of databases and how they have different uses within a database system. Next, you explored data pipelines and how ETL and ELT processes help get data where it needs to go and transform it to be useful during that process. You also learned about different data storage systems that you might use in a pipeline. Additionally, you explored more common BI tools and how to interact with stakeholders effectively. You even had a chance to create your own pipeline. Then, by exploring database and pipeline optimization, you were able to consider how BI processes and systems are often iterative. Finally, you had an opportunity to put all of this new knowledge to work by creating a pipeline system and reporting tables for your portfolio project. Coming up, you have even more exciting discoveries to make. Now that you understand how to create systems to deliver data to stakeholders, it's time to start thinking about how to present that data and make it accessible and useful for decision making. In the next course, you're going to learn more about how to design visualizations and dashboards for BI and present those insights. And finally, you'll finish your portfolio project. Great work so far.